Well, welcome back to my UK workshop. Last time I joined you from Pakistan, where it was considerably warmer than it is here today. I'm returning to my series on the mini lathe. This is episode number 10 on mounting the lathe. I've done all the preparation offline. I've prepared the base and the mounting. And today we're just going to assemble and test this mounting to see if indeed it does provide a way of isolating the lathe from any twist or distortion in the base. So you can see here the lathe mounted on its base. This is the piece of kitchen worktop which um, I showed in my previous videos. I've um, cut it to size, I put edging around, hardwood edging, and I've mounted a box on the back here which will contain the electronics and uh, underneath it has three feet, which I dis uh, discussed before about the, the need to have a three-point mounting so that it sits comfortably on any surface. So what I'm going to do now is remove the lathe from this base and we'll have a closer look at the mounting. You saw me start to make these feet for the lathe and um, at the headstock end it includes uh, two mounting bolts with a radius underneath to this cross member so that it can rotate like that. And at the tailstock foot, we have this dome surface here so it can rotate in both directions. Now, the lathe came with quarter inch drilled holes and I felt that um, quarter inch bolts were just over the top for mounting on this structure. And in fact, there wasn't sufficient clearance around the edges here to clear the radii in the castings. So I felt five millimeter bolts were better. So I made these spacers or sleeves to provide positive location between the five millimeter bolts and the holes, existing holes in the casting. So we'll put this back together and then we'll have a look at how this sits on the base. Let's take a closer look at the base. It includes three nylon bushes. These are mounts for the holding down bolts, two five millimeter, which are threaded at the headstock end, and one clearance bush at the tailstock for the six millimeter bolt, which screws up into the underside of the base. These are slightly raised areas, which is of course beneficial. They also provide a slightly soft mounting, and by not tapping all the way through, provide a thread locking feature, which means that you don't need locking nuts. So I've made this cardboard mock-up of the base and the lathe. First of all the lathe, so you can see here the round section bed and the square section of the bed. You can see here the headstock and the tailstock. Uh, here are the mounting feet at the headstock end and the point contact at the tailstock or the foot end. And to represent the center line of the lathe we've got this drinking straw which uh, is attached to the headstock and then there's a short extension from the tailstock and there's a small gap between the two. If we twist the bed by gripping the tailstock and the headstock, we can see a small movement there. And here is the base. The base is uh, deliberately thin so that we can easily twist it like that and bend it like that. So we'll assemble it. And uh, to assemble it, I just attach these elastic bands and they represent the downward pull of the uh, clamping bolts at the headstock and the tailstock end. Mm -hmm. 
So here it is um, assembled, a little cardboard mock-up. So you can see the simulated holding down bolts at each end. And I've tried to get the relative stiffness compared with the flexibility of the cardboard base. If we uh, look at the bed in this direction, we can bend the base like that. And you can see that the lathe stays still and uh, hopefully there are very minimal bending moments transferred to the lathe. And similarly if we twist the, the base as if it were not sitting comfortably on a flat surface we'll have a look at what happens on the end. So we can see that if we restrain the tailstock end and twist the headstock end of the base, we get this kind of movement. And uh, we can restrain the headstock and twist this end. Same thing really. The lathe is isolated from these kinds of movements. Now if we look at the gap between the two straws, then hopefully we can see that even though we move this about quite violently, there's no detectable movement there. So I'm going to bring the lathe and the base onto the bench now. I'm going to test to see if in reality this mounting system works. So we're going to use this test bar which I made for a previous video. And we're going, this has a zero Morse taper which fits in the headstock and we're going to put a clock, a DTI, on the saddle and as I discussed in the previous video we want to make sure the saddle is as far to the right hand side of the bed as possible so we just mount this and we're going to get we're going to look for transverse movement which is the kind of movement that you would see um, if the lathe weren't cutting parallel. So in other words, a movement of the tool in and out. So we're going to zero that clock, and then we're going to twist the bed by grabbing it on alternate corners and forcibly twisting the bed and see if we can get a reading on the DTI. The first thing we're going to do is lift the base from both ends and then we're going to twist the base and then finally I'm going to try and twist the base as hard as I can Okay, I can't see any detectable movement there. Now in order to validate this test, we need to actually show that uh, similar kinds of forces applied through the bed of the lathe do in fact cause distortion. Um, otherwise this test is meaningless. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this setup and we're going to apply a moment across the length of the bed, twisting the bed, and we're going to see what kind of DTI reading we pick up. Now I've done a back of the envelope calculation uh, to see what kind of bending moments you could see on the lathe in the most unfavorable circumstances if it were firmly um, bolted down to this base and assuming the base has no stiffness itself. So the total weight of this assembly of the lathe, the base, the motor, the counter drive, um, the chuck and a few other bits and pieces that comes to 33 kilograms and if I assume um, around about two-thirds of the mass is at the headstock end that's 22 kilograms of mass here and about 11 here acting on the center of the base and uh, if I twist one lift one corner and uh, hold the diametrically opposite corner that gives a bending moment here of around about 31 Newton meters 
so I'm going to apply a lever on the end here and a torque of 31 newton meters across the length of the bed and we'll see what kind of uh, indication we get on the DTI. I'm going to weigh down this corner of the base and we're going to put a lever across the other end of the lathe like this. I'm going to clamp it to the tailstock and from the center line of the lathe to here is 0.53 meters and we're going to put a weight on the end there. I'm going to simulate twist of the bed. So here are our weights. This is around about five kilograms and we're going to attach this to the end of this beam. Now that's about as much as, as this aluminium will take, this aluminium angle section will take. It's about to buckle. And uh, let's have a look at the DTI and see what we've got on there. But that's uh, around about three thou of lateral deflection. So that, that turning moment of 31 newton meters is across, applied across the length of the bed is translating into a lateral deflection at this point of three thou. And uh, I'll just lift that and we'll see if the DTI returns to Yeah, almost. So releasing again. Yeah, so you can see that the bed is indeed susceptible to significant movements if the lathe isn't properly mounted. Okay, I can remove this uh, counterbalance now. Hopefully that's given us a, um, some insight into how to mount a small lathe. Next time we will be moving on to looking at the uh, drive, hopefully. Um, what I didn't explain earlier is that uh, the power supply will fit in here. It bolts up underneath. The motor drive We'll locate there. I've made a sheet metal top, which we'll talk about next time. I already have the motor. It's a 12 volt DC motor, uh, which we'll locate in roughly this position. And uh, I have a counter shaft, which I worked on a long time ago, and I need to modify that to um, uh, suit the application here. So in our later videos, we're going to be looking at those. I'm not sure of the exact order at the moment because, um, because uh, it depends on when parts arrive and when I can get back to this workshop. Uh, I also have a chuck um, that has a metric thread, that has an imperial thread, so I have to decide whether to modify the chuck or whether to modify the mandrel. Um, that also will be the subject of another video. Uh, any comments, any suggestions, always welcome. Thanks for joining me.